Hey fellow lab rats, this is Rebecca from the Lab Rat YouTube channel. Today in this phlebotomy lecture series, we are going to be talking about the clinical laboratory. All right, let's get started. After listening to this presentation, you will be able to do the following. You'll be able to distinguish between the two main divisions of the laboratory, as well as the subsections within each of these divisions. You'll be able to describe the qualifications and functions of laboratory personnel. You'll also be able to discuss the basic functions of each department in the laboratory, including hematology, clinical chemistry, blood bank, serology, microbiology, and urinalysis. Also, after listening to this presentation, you'll be able to describe the appropriate collection and handling of specimens analyzed in the clinical laboratory, as well as identify the commonly performed tests in each department of the laboratory. In addition to the learning outcomes of this presentation, there are also important terms that you will need to know. These are autopsy, biopsy, frozen section, medical laboratory assistant, medical laboratory scientist, medical laboratory technician, and pathologist. To get started, let's look at the breakdown of the organization of a laboratory. We will discuss all these pieces in more details in the upcoming slides. So at the top here is the laboratory director who is in charge of all of the laboratory personnel. So these are generally pathologists. Under that director is the department manager or managers, depending on the size of the laboratory, of course. Um, and then below here we have anatomic pathology. So anatomic pathology includes autopsy services as well as histology and cytology departments. The histology and cytology departments evaluate cells and tissues. Then we have clinical pathology, which includes clinical chemistry labs, hematology coagulation labs, microbiology and parasitology, blood bank, molecular procedures, and immunology. So we'll discuss these laboratories, uh, laboratory areas momentarily here. And then there are support services within the lab. So these include phlebotomists, so the professionals who draw appropriate blood specimens from patients, specimen processing and clerical services, so those that make sure that the paperwork and requisitions on each sample, as well as the sample are registered and prepared properly for testing. Uh, there are also people who work in laboratory information systems. So all the patient records, specimen information, and results are put into a specific type of software depending on the laboratory. So this software requires professionals that are specifically trained in the laboratory and in computer information systems. So a pathologist is generally the laboratory director who is responsible for everything that happens within the laboratory. So pathologists are physicians that have training in clinical or anatomic pathology and require a special residency in pathology after their first four years in medical school. The laboratory supervisor or department manager is typically a medical laboratory scientist or MLS that has additional experience and skills. This position requires the supervision of quality control of the laboratory tests and maintenance of the instruments that are running the tests. This position also ensures that all regulatory and legal requirements are met. Usually this position is held by people who have a master's degree, um, although it is not required, and they generally have five or more years of laboratory experience. A section supervisor will have a, a medical laboratory scientist or MLS degree, possibly a spe specialty certification for that department um, or many years of experience in that department. They are accountable to the laboratory manager and are responsible for operational functions in their department. So for example, there'll be a clinical chemistry section supervisor, a hematology section supervisor, et cetera. A medical laboratory scientist or MLS is a medical technologist who has a bachelor's degree. The MLS professional is responsible for performing assays on samples and also can supervise and train other technologists in the laboratory. They correlate and interpret data and are generally taught a more detailed understanding of the science behind specific testing in comparison to the medical laboratory technologist or MLT. 
Upon graduation with their MLS degree, they are able to take the American Society of Clinical Pathology or ASCP Board of Certification exam. So this is an exam that is not currently required in all laboratories across the United States, but area hospitals and laboratories are trending towards only allowing ASCP certified laboratory professionals. The Medical Laboratory Technologist, or MLT, is a medical technologist who has an associate's degree. MLTs perform the same job as the MLS, just have an associate's degree. They're also eligible to take the ASCP Board of Certification exam. Some laboratories tend to pay those with the MLS, uh, MLS certification a bit more than those with the MLT certification. Um, however, a lot of labs are kind of trending towards paying both certifications the same amount. Just kind of depends on where you work at. Now, a medical laboratory assistant is responsible for receiving and sorting incoming specimens. They must accurately identify the name of the patient and one other identifier, receive each specimen into the laboratory, and then process it appropriately. So for example, if a clinical chemistry blood tube is sent to the lab, the laboratory assistant must identify who the sample is, uh, who, it, who it's for, uh, receive it into the laboratory information system, so the computer system, and then spin the blood in a centrifuge. Once the sample is properly centrifuged, uh, they then must deliver it to the department that is performing the test that the physician or nurse has ordered on that specimen. Uh, medical laboratory assistants also have phlebotomy training. Now, phlebotomists are responsible for collecting blood specimens from patients. They perform venipuncture, which is withdrawing blood from a patient's veins for testing. They also do finger strict draws using a lancet to puncture the capillaries of the finger to get a few drops of blood for testing. Uh, phlebotomists are also trained in performing heel sticks, which is performed on newborn babies. In this procedure, the phlebotomist will prick the baby's heel to collect blood for testing. Now, some laboratories will have educational coordinators for staff and students that do clinical rotations at that specific laboratory. Um, a point of care testing coordinator will monitor the point of care testing in the healthcare system uh, to help ensure that laboratory standards are being met. Uh, so point of care testing is testing that is done outside of the laboratory, usually at the patient's bedside. An example of this would be a nurse using a glucometer at the patient's bedside to check their blood glucose levels. The laboratory information systems manager is very important to the operation of the computer systems that report test results. The quality and management coordinator makes sure that the laboratory is following regulations and also standards that produce quality results. So there are two main sections of the laboratory, which we discuss on that kind of that breakdown on the first couple of slides. Um, so there's two main sections of the lab. So the first section is the anatomical uh, section, which includes cytologists who perform pap smears and histology technicians, which repair specimens for pathology review by placing thin slices onto the slide and staining them. So this is like a tissue, so thin slices of tissue. Um, cytogenetics may include genetic testing and flow cytometry testing. The second section of the laboratory is the clinical laboratory section. The different areas of the clinical laboratory include hematology, coagulation, chemistry, blood bank, serology, microbiology, and urinalysis. Uh, we'll talk about these specific clinical laboratory departments on the following slides. So the first one here is the hematology department. So the hematology department uses whole blood specimens to help diagnose anemias, leukemias, and other blood cell anomalies. So the key terms to know for this section are anemia, anticoagulant, hemogram, leukemia, plasma, and serum. So anemia is a condition that results from a lack of red blood cells or when the red blood cells are dysfunctional, meaning they just don't work properly. They don't do their jobs correctly. Now the term anticoagulant uh, means a chemical substance that prevents or reduces the coagulation or clotting of blood. So anticoagulants are used um, for therapeutic reasons, so given as a medication to patients, um, and also anticoagulants are in uh, specific uh, blood specimen tubes. A hemogram is a visual representation of a complete blood count. We'll talk about complete blood counts here in a minute. Leukemia is a type of blood cancer. 
Now, plasma is the liquid portion of blood. So when in a specimen tube, it is found in anticoagulated samples and still contains fibrinogen. Serum is the clear yellow fluid that remains in a specimen tube after the blood has been clotted and centrifuged. It does not have fibrinogen present uh, because fibrinogen is used, uh, used up to form the clot. The specimen required in hematology is whole blood anticoagulated with EDTA. Uh, so this tube is the purple or lavender top tube, and these tubes must be inverted gently eight times to prevent clotting. So even microclots, so very, very small clots in the tube, will invalidate the results. And these clots can also clog up the instrument, causing a delay for other patient results. So for this lecture, um, specifically in the hematology section, some of the key terms were plasma and serum. So I figure we should review it here. So plasma is the liquid portion of an anticoagulated tube. So there's no, there's no clot. So an example of this would be in a centrifuge light green tube. So you don't have to wait for that tube to clot before you centrifuge it. So serum is the liquid portion of the clotted sample. An example of this would be in a centrifuge gold top tube. Um, so gold top tubes, you have to wait for them to clot and then you spin them down. So the difference is the serum lacks fibrinogen because that fibrinogen has been used to form the clot. So, um, Serum is from clotted blood and it does not have fibrinogen. Plasma is from non-clotted blood that's spun down, of course, and it has fibrinogen in it. So it's just determined by the presence or absence of the fibrinogen. Okay, so one of the main tests performed in the hematology department is called the CBC or complete blood count. This is a test that determines how many white and red blood cells are present, the platelet counts, and also hemoglobin and hematocrit. The CBC can also include a differential, which determines the distribution of white blood cells. So if you end up enrolling in an MLT or MLS program, you'll learn about the different types of white blood cells. So for example, neutrophils and lymphocytes. So the differential differentiates the types and numbers of each type of white blood cell the patient has in their blood. And these types and numbers can kind of tell the physician what's going on with the patient's blood. So H and H or hemoglobin and hematocrit are also a part of the CBC. And hematocrit is the volume percentage of red blood cells present within the blood. And hemoglobin measures the oxygen carrying capacity of the red blood cells within the blood. The CBC also includes things called indices, which are calculations that determine things about the red blood cells. So these indices include MCH, MCHC, MCV, and RDW. The MCH, or mean corpuscular hemoglobin, determines the amount of hemoglobin that is present within the red blood cell. The MCHC, or mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration, determines the weight of hemoglobin in the red blood cell. The MCV, or mean corpuscular volume, determines the size of the red blood cells. And lastly, the RDW, or red cell distribution width, determines the differences in size of red blood cells. The hematology department also performs cell counts on body fluids like synovial fluid from the joints or cerebral spinal fluid from the spinal cord. Uh, these counts determine the number of red and white blood cells present in the fluid, and if indicated, a cell differential can be performed on these fluids just like in blood. They can also evaluate bone marrow biopsies, which determine the type and number of cells within the bone marrow. Sedimentation rates are also another test performed in the hematology lab. So these are also called SED rates. So the SED rate measures how quickly the patient's red blood cells settle and is used to monitor and measure inflammatory activity within the body. Reticulocyte counts or retic counts evaluate the body's production of red blood cells. Uh, the hematology department can also perform screening tests for sickle cell disease and perform special uh, cytochemical stains to determine types of leukemia in patients. Now, the coagulation department tests samples to assess bleeding and clotting problems. Blood samples used for coagulation tests must be collected in a light blue top tube, which contains sodium citrate. The two main tests performed in the coagulation laboratory are prothrombin time, or PT, and the activated partial thromboplastin, or APTT. 
Uh, this is also called PTT as well. Um, they are, are used to identify bleeding disorders and also to monitor anticoagulant therapy. So a lot of patients use anticoagulant drugs um, like warfarin and coumadin, uh, which are commonly called uh, blood thinners. So it's important that given their use that the effects of these drugs are monitored and the coagulation department plays a big part in that monitoring. The coag coagulation department also tests antithrombin, which is used as a screening test for increased blood clotting tendencies. Protein CNS, which evaluates for venous thrombosis, which are blood clots in the veins. Factor assays determine if the patient has a factor deficiency, which will uh, interfere with the blood's ability to clot. Uh, the D-dimer test measures abnormal blood clotting and looks for fibrinolysis, which is the breakdown of blood clots within the body. The coagulation department also performs a test for increased fibrinolysis, so an increase in the breakdown of blood clots in the body. So this is called a fibrin degradation products, so they can test for that. Uh, they also test for fibrinogen, which is something the blood, uh, something that is needed by the blood to form a clot. Um, heparin anti-10A is used to monitor anticoagulation therapy in a patient. And then platelet aggregation helps to evaluate the function of the patient's platelets. The clinical chemistry laboratory tests serum, plasma, and other body fluids such as urine, cerebral spinal fluid, and pleural fluid. They use large automated instruments and computers that are designed to work with a very small volume sample. The key terms for clinical chemistry are centrifugation, electrophoresis, hemolyze, icteric, immunochemistry, lipemic, molecular diagnostics, and toxicology. Centrifugation is used to separate the serum or plasma from the red blood cells in a specimen too. Clinical chemistry specimens are centrifuged because the majority of the tests uh, in this department are performed on the serum or plasma, not on the red blood cells. Electrophoresis is a technique used in the clinical chemistry department to separate proteins based on their size and electrical charge. Hemolyzed blood is when the red blood cells have ruptured. In phlebotomy, this is caused by incorrect needle size, improper tube mixing, excessive suctioning, prolonged tourniquet use, and just generally difficult collections. The term icteric means jaundice, which is a yellowing color to the skin and can cause a yellowing, greenish, brownish tint to the serum or plasma in a specimen. Aminochemistry is a chemical analysis performed using the interaction of antigens and antibodies. Lipemia is when a blood sample uh, contains a high amount of lipids or fats in it. Uh, the plasma or serum in a lipemic specimen will appear cloudy white in color. Mole molecular diagnostics is an area of the lab that performs genetic testing. And then toxicology is the study of poisons. On the last slide, I mentioned hemolysis, lipemia, and icterus. <coughs> Excuse me. So here are examples of those in pictures. Um, so the far right, or I'm sorry, the far left hand photo shows a normal serum sample. The serum at the top is clear and straw colored. The picture labeled hemolysis shows a hemolyzed sample. So you can see the plasma is a red color, not that normal straw color. This is caused by the destruction of red blood cells. The next sample is a lipemic sample. You can see that the plasma is cloudy and almost milky. And actually this particular sample, um, I actually took this picture just a couple weeks ago. Um, it's, it's cloudy and milky, but it also probably is hemolyzed because it kind of has a pinkish tint to it. So you can have hemolyzed and lipemic specimens at the same time. Um, but the lipemia is what causes this cloudy, like milky type of uh, color. Um, so now the last sample on the, uh, the far right hand side shows an icteric sample caused by jaundice. So the plasma at the top is kind of a greenish, darkish yellow, almost kind of like a brownish color. The clinical chemistry department of the laboratory performs a lot of uh, different tests. Uh, so the tests on this slide um, are tests that primarily assess the function of the liver. So these tests include alanine aminotransferase, or ALT, aspartate aminotransferase, or AST, alkaline phosphatase, or ALP, bilirubin, and gamma glutamyltransferase, or GGT, 
So AST and ALP are also in a couple of um, other tissue sources other than the liver, but both are primarily considered uh, liver tests or hepatic tests. The clinical chemistry tests that primarily assess the function of the kidney are blood urea nitrogen, or it's abbreviated BUN or BUN, creatinine, and creatinine clearance. The clinical chemistry tests that primarily assess the function of the heart are troponin T and I, myoglobin, creatinine kinase, which also has en isoenzymes, and BNP. Creatinine kinase and its isoenzymes can also indicate muscle or brain disorders, not just the heart. But it's the CK is primarily a heart. Uh, it's associated with the heart. The clinical chemistry tests that primarily assess the lipid or fat content in the blood are cholesterol, HDL, LDL, and triglycerides. The clinical chemistry tests that primarily assess the pancreas are lipase and amylase. And the tests that primarily assess the electrolyte status of the body are carbon dioxide, chloride, sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium. Other tests uh, that are performed in the clinical laboratory include albumin. So decreased levels of this indicate malnutrition or liver, liver or kidney disorders. Total protein. So decreased levels of this indicate liver or kidney disorders. Alcohol levels and drug screens can also be tested in this department. Ammonia. So increased levels uh, of this can indicate severe liver disorders. Arterial blood gases test for the pH of blood as well as for oxygen and carbon dioxide levels. Glucose and glucose tolerance tests, or GTTs, detect blood sugar levels in the body to help diagnose diabetes. Hemoglobin A1C is a test used for the monitoring of diabetes. Haptoglobin helps to evaluate hemolytic anemia, which is an anemia caused by the premature destruction of the red blood cells. Hemoglobin electrophoresis is a test that measures the different types of hemoglobin in the blood. The clinical, cl the <laughs> the clinical chemistry department can also test for levels of iron, decreased levels, meaning uh, that the patient is experiencing iron deficiency anemia, lactate dehydrogenase, or LD. So increased levels of this may indicate a heart attack or lung or liver disorders. Lead levels in the body uh, may be detected if a patient has lead poisoning. Uh, the clinical chemistry department also performs lithium testing, which is a psychoactive drug. Phosphorus, which is a mineral that is associated with skeletal or endocrine disorders. Prostate-specific antigen, or PSA, which can help to detect prostate cancer. And uric acid, so increases of this may indicate that the patient has a kidney disorder or gout, and gout is, gout is a type of inflammatory painful arthritis. So now, of course, this lecture is directed towards phlebotomy students. So of course, if you are an MLS or an MLT student, these various tests would be described in greater detail. Certain groups of tests or panels are commonly used to evaluate general health status or to help diagnose a suspected disorder. So these are a panel of tests that the physician orders on a patient um, rather than just ordering one test at a time or two tests at a time. So commonly run panels in the clinical chemistry laboratory are the basic metabolic panel, um, the comprehensive metabolic panel, the hepatic panel, lipid panel, and renal panel. The basic metabolic panel, or BMP, includes glucose, BUN, creatinine, sodium, potassium, chloride, carbon dioxide, and calcium. The CMP, or comprehensive metabolic panel, includes everything that the BMP does, but also additionally has AST, ALT, ALP, total protein, albumin, and bilirubin. Now the hepatic panel, uh, which is, so when you hear the word hepatic, you wanna think liver. So these are tests that are looking for issues within the liver. So this includes ALP, ALT, AST, total bilirubin and direct bilirubin, total protein, and albumin. The lipid panel includes cholesterol, triglycerides, HDL, and LDL. And the renal panel, so this is looking for kidney functioning. So if you ever hear the word renal, you want to associate it with the, the kidney. So renal panel includes glucose, BUN, creatinine, carbon dioxide, chloride, sodium, potassium, total protein, albumin, calcium, and phosphorus. 
Then we have the immunohematology or blood banking department. This is where MLS or MLT professionals help to supply the best blood component for patients who need it and also receive, store, and process uh, donated uh, blood units. The key terms associated with the blood bank section of laboratory are antigens, which are substances when they are foreign to the body cause the immune system to activate. And this is significant in blood banking because there are antigens present on red blood cells. Antibodies, which are produced by the immune system when exposed to a foreign antigen. Compatibility or cross-match, which is performed to determine if a particular unit of donated blood can be transfused safely to a patient. Cryoprecipitate is a blood product that is a portion of plasma rich in clotting factors. Uh, cryo uh, can be given to a patient if needed. Fresh frozen plasma is another type of blood product that is made from the liquid portion of blood. Packed red blood cells um, are red blood cells that have been separated from the plasma to be donated for transfusion. Rh type refers to an inherited protein found on the surface of the red blood cells. So if present, um, a patient is considered Rh positive. If absent, the patient is considered Rh negative. And then a unit of blood. So this is what you see on the right-hand side of the slide. So these three units of blood, and these are used for transfusion services. So if somebody donates this blood, it gets tested in the blood bank to make sure that it's uh, one, free of diseases, and also um, if it's compatible for patients that need it, and then they get transfused uh, to the patient that needs it. The preferred specimen type for blood banking specimens is the pink top. So lavender or red tops can also be used, but SSDs are not allowed. But again, the, the pink top is the preferred specimen. Proper identification of blood banking specimens is absolutely critical. So if the specimen is not properly identified, a patient may be misidentified and given the wrong unit of blood. And this can literally kill a patient. So I cannot stress enough how critical it is that these tubes are labeled correctly. The blood bank laboratory performs type and screen. So this is where the patient's ABO and RH blood type is determined and their plasma is tested for clinically significant antibodies that may cause a transfusion reaction uh, when given a donor blood. The type and cross match is performed to determine the patient's ABO and RH blood type and compatibility with donor blood is determined. Just antibody screens can also be performed to detect any clinically significant antibodies that may cause a transfusion reaction uh, with donor blood. Antibody panels are performed when a patient has a positive antibody screen. Um, these panels are done to determine the antibody that is present uh, within the patient's uh, plasma. A direct antihuman globulin or DAT tests are performed to detect an abnormal antibodies um, if, if present on the patient's red blood cells. And the group and type determines just the patient's AVO and RH blood type. Now the serology or immunology department in the laboratory performs testing to evaluate the body's immune responses. It looks for the presence of antibodies produced against foreign antigens and antibodies produced against oneself, which are called autoantibodies. Serum separator tubes can interfere with antigen antibody reactions, so they cannot be used for this type of testing. The key terms for the serology immunology department are autoimmunity, immunoglobulin, immunology, and serology. Autoimmunity is when a patient's body produces antibodies that mistakenly attack their own antigens. Immunoglobulin is another term for antibodies. The serology and immunology department performs a variety of tests. Anti-human immunodeficiency or HIV testing is performed here. Uh, they also perform something called anti-nuclear antibody or ANA testing. This is a test that looks for nuclear autoantibodies in a patient. Anti-streptolysin O or ASO screens, which detect a uh, previous streptococcus infection, which is a type of bacterial infection. Streptococcus is the species type. The C-reactive protein or CRP test is increased in patients that have inflammation. Another test the serology immunology department is, uh, does is the detection of cold agglutinins. And cold agglutinins are types of antibodies that um, cause red blood cells to agglutinate or clump together at low temperatures. Febrile agglutinins are antibodies to microorganisms that cause fever. 
The serology and immunology department also tests for these. Fluorescent antinuclear antibodies or FNA tests detect nuclear autoantibodies and fluorescent treponemal antibody absorb tests look for syphilis, which is a sexually transmitted infection. The serology and immunology department also does testing for hepatitis antibodies. So these occur from viral infections, either hepatitis A or hepatitis C, and they also look for hepatitis B surface antigens. The serology and immunology department of the laboratory also performs HCG testing, which stands for human chorionic gonadotropin. Um, so this is actually a hormone that's produced uh, in pregnant patients. So it's used as a pregnancy test. Uh, they can also test for immunoglobulins, which are antibodies, and monospot testing, which is a test for infectious mononucleosis. So uh, mo infectious mononucleosis, or mono for short, is a contagious disease that is common among teenagers and young adults. And then the rapid uh, plasma reagent, or RPR test, this is a test performed in the serology immunology department that tests for syphilis, which I've already mentioned in a previous slide. The Venereal Disease Research Laboratory Test, or VDRL, is another test for syphilis. Um, serology immunology labs use the Western blot test for the confirmation of HIV infection, which we've already discussed. Uh, there are autoantibodies in patients that have rheumatoid arthritis, which we can test for. These are called rheumatoid factors. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune inflammatory disease that causes the body to mainly attack the joints, causing pain and inflammation. This section of the laboratory also can perform rubella titers, which are uh, an antibody titer, specific antibody titer, uh, which tests for how much antibody a patient has to determine their immune status to a specific disease. So rubella is a viral infection. It's also called the German measles. Uh, so we have vaccination to this virus and titer tests of it can determine how immune a patient is to it after they have been vaccinated. So we do titers for a lot of different antibodies. Uh, Rebel is just an example of one of the, the titer tests that the serology immunology department uh, performs. The microbiology department identifies microorganisms, viruses, certain fungus types, and parasites in patient samples. Cultures can be taken from the throat, from wounds, vaginal secretions, urine, and blood, just as examples. These cultures are then grown on specific nutrient plates. So this department determines normal bacterial flora from pathogens, as well as identifies the antibiotics that will be able to kill those pathogenic organisms. So the key terms for this section are bacteria, bacteriology, culture and sensitivity, gram stain, microbiology, microorganism, mycology, parasitology, and virology. So bacteria are mostly free living organisms that often contain one cell. Bacteriology is the study of bacteria. A microorganism is a microscopic organism that can be either a bacterium, a virus, or fungus as examples. Microbiology is the study of microorganisms. Now, the gram stain is a type of staining procedure that is used to classify bacterial species based on two large groups, gram-positive bacteria and gram-negative bacteria. Gram-positive bacteria will stain purple and gram-negative uh, bacteria will stain pink with this stain. So now if you enroll in an MLT or MLS program, uh, you'll learn all about gram staining. Mycology is the study of fungi, parasitology is the study of parasites, and virology is the study of viruses. Now I talked about this on the previous slide, uh, but the gram stain is a procedure performed uh, very regularly in the microbiology department. The gram stain is a type of staining procedure that is used to classify bacterial species based on those two large groups, which I mentioned, gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. So the gram-positive bacteria stain purple and the gram-negative will stain pink. Blood cultures detect if there is any bacteria or fungi in a patient's blood. A fungal culture detects the presence of and aids in the identification of any fungal infections a patient might have. Acid fast cultures detect the presence of and aid in the identification of any acid fast bacteria. So these are bacteria uh, like the ones that cause tuberculosis. A culture and sensitivity includes growing a bacteria from a patient's culture and then determining what antibiotics will kill that specific bacteria. So we will know what, uh, what antibiotic to give to that patient based on that sensitivity. The occult blood tests 
looks for traces of blood in a patient's stool. And then an open parasite test looks for parasitic infections in a patient's stool. So all of these tests are performed in the microbiology laboratory. The urinalysis department of the clinical laboratory analyzes a patient's urine to help diagnose things like diabetes mellitus, infectious disease, and kidney disease. The urinalysis looks at physical characteristics, chemical composition, and microscopic examination for abnormal urinary sediment. The key terms for this section are cast, first morning sample, glycosuria, hematuria, hemoglobinuria, ketonuria, proteinuria, urinalysis, and reagent strip. Casts are microscopic cylindrical structures produced by the kidney that can be seen in a microscopic urinalysis evaluation, and these indicate certain disease states. First morning urine samples are those taken directly after a patient wakes in the morning. A glycosuria is when glucose is present in the urine. Hematuria is when there is blood present in the, the urine. Hemoglobinuria is when there is hemoglobin present in the urine. Ketonuria is when there are ketones present in the urine. Proteinuria is, yep, you guessed it, when there is protein present in the urine. Urinalysis is a test of the urine used to detect a wide range of disorders. So reagent strips or dipsticks are little strips that have pads of chemicals on them. When dipped into the urine, color changes on these pads occur if certain substances are present within that urine. Urinalysis specimens can be first morning specimens, so those that are collected directly after a patient wakes in the morning. Random specimens are urine samples taken at any point in the day. 24 hour urine samples are collected in large jugs and the patient collects their urine over an entire 24 hour period in these jugs. And then clean catch collections require the patient to use a package sterile wipe to clean the area before urination. Um, they're then instructed to begin collecting their sample midstream. Um, so clean catch collections are required if the physician suspects a bacterial urinary tract infection. So we only want to grow the bacteria that's causing um, the infection in the urinary tract system. So this requires no contaminant bacteria to be collected like from this, the patient's skin. In a urinalysis, the color and clarity of the urine is evaluated and the specific gravity of the urine, which measures the concentration of particles and the density of the urine when compared with the density of water. Additionally, the chemistry values of the urine are checked and reported. So things like pH, glucose levels, ketones, blood, nitrites, and leukocyte esterase. So these chemistry values are normally determined via a dipstick or a reagent strip. Microscopic evaluations are also performed on these urines and substances such as white blood cells, bacteria, casts, or red blood cells are reported to the patient's physician. So this concludes this presentation. Please do not forget to like this video and subscribe to my channel to check out more educational laboratory content. And as always, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the comment section below.